Howdy, I'm Andy Hogan. I'm a historical guide at the Will Rogers Memorial Museums in Claremore, Oklahoma. I started out as a, an educator, uh, educated at Northeastern State College before it became the university. Uh, ended up going back and getting my master's at Northeastern State University. Taught school for several years, ended up being an elementary school principal here in Claremore for the last 20 years, and that's how I got involved with the Will Rogers Memorial Museums. Uh, my function here at the museum is to tell about Will, kind of depict his life a little bit. I get to portray him a little bit. And we have uh, tour groups come in from all over the world, adult groups, and we have quite a few schools come in. We really like to have schools come in that have had Oklahoma history in their classrooms because Will was so involved with Oklahoma history, not necessarily with making it, but he was there when it was being made. Uh, Will came from Indian background. His mother and his father were both educated at the male and female Cherokee seminaries over in Tahlequah. Uh, his dad was from around Westville and his mother was from around Tahlequah. Uh, they met there at the seminary. Uh, they got married and moved to this part of the country. This is one of the seven districts of the Cherokee Nation. This was the Cooey Scooey District which is the Cherokee name for John Ross, named after John Ross uh, when he was the chief. But anyhow, Will's mom and dad came to this part of the country, and his dad opened up a trading post. Uh, along came the Civil War. Will's mom and dad had had one daughter at this time. Uh, the Cherokees, as a group, joined up with the South. Uh, all of them didn't decide to do that, and there was a split between the Cherokees. But Will's father went with the traditions of the Cherokee Nation, and he joined up with a Cherokee cavalry group that was uh, manned by a man named Colonel William Penn Adair, and, uh, which should sound familiar to us if we've had Oklahoma history because Adair County was named after William Penn Adair. Will Rogers was named after William Penn Adair. Will's father, Clem Van Rogers, uh, had a county named after him. This Rogers County, of course, is named after Clem Van Rogers. But anyhow, Clem Van Rogers and, and Mary America Scrimshire uh, got married, had the one daughter. During the Civil War, they tried to get the one daughter out of this part of the country, and she died while they were doing their traveling. Uh, after the Civil War, Will's mom and dad came back and had to start all over again. Uh, both of them were part Cherokee. They were around, his dad was 5 sixteenths, and his mom was 1 fourth. And Will said, I wasn't very good in math, so I don't know what that made me, but but we rounded off and call him one-fourth anyhow. Uh, his dad chose a, a large operation. He chose, chose a, a large area to farm, everything from the Caney River this way to the Verdigree River, uh, something like 60,000 acres he chose to farm. And what he did was, during the Civil War, uh, he realized there were a lot of cattle down in Texas that were not being dealt with. They were just running wild, the Longhorns and uh, they weren't worth much down there. There were thousands of them, but if he could get them up in this part of the country, of course, he didn't have to pay for them. He didn't have to pay for this grass up here because it belonged to the Cherokees. So he began to prosper because the cattle were worth about $4 a piece here, or he could put them on a train after they got fat on this free grass and send them to Chicago or Kansas City. They were worth about $35 a piece. So Will's dad began to prosper as a farmer. Very serious-minded man, very fair-minded man. Uh, because of his Cherokee ancestry, uh, he was used quite a bit in settling disputes. He was kind of like a judge. He was a, he was a senator for the Cherokee Nation. And, of course, when the uh, statehood came along, well, he got to be a representative of this part of the country. Now, Will was the eighth child born in his family, the last child born in his family, the youngest one, the only boy that lived because four of the children died from childhood diseases. Uh, Will was raised there on the, form, on the farm. He was a little bit spoiled, or he was a whole, a whole lot spoiled. Uh, the three older sisters were quite a bit older than him, 16 years, 10 years, and 6 years older than him. And uh, they kind of carried him around like a baby, they, uh, like a doll. They treated him like a little doll. His mama thought he was a, a grand little fellow. His dad figured that he'd grow up and run the ranch someday, being the only boy in the family that survived. And his mother thought he would grow up to be a Methodist preacher. And Will wasn't really planning on growing up. He was kind of like Peter Pan. He wanted to stay young and play forever. 
Uh, Will was fun. People always enjoyed Will, but he also developed a reputation as being one who just wouldn't apply himself to anything. Uh, when he was eight years old, uh, it came time to go to school. And he told his daddy that uh, him being a cowboy, he didn't need to know nothing, so he ain't going to go to school. Well, his dad had a different idea. The closest school was a little Cherokee school up at Chelsea, about 35 miles up the road. And Will's mom and dad had been educated. The three older sisters had all been educated, so Willie had to be educated. So he had to go live with Sally, his oldest sister, up at Chelsea. The two older sisters, both of them moved into the Chelsea area after they got married. The school was about two miles from her house, Drum Ghoul School. Uh, Will said, I'm the only kid up there that had any white blood in me in that school at all. Therefore, my honesty was always in question. Uh, the school being about two miles from her house, he had to ride his horse to school and ride his horse home. Uh, that was the two things he liked about school. Uh, Will said that uh, I went to school with the attitude of they ain't going to teach me nothing. And he said, I was, I was successful. And he said, I wanted to remain ignorant. And I was successful at that too. But he said, you know, we're all ignorant. We're just ignorant on different subjects. And he said, nobody can be as stupid as an educated man once you get him off the area on which he is educated. But Will was not educated in school because he chose not to be. He could learn anything he really wanted to learn. He really didn't want to learn any of the writing skills. Ended up writing for 13 years a weekly newspaper article, for nine years a daily newspaper article, but he still wrote just like he did in elementary school. He got in trouble enough times that his dad finally sent him to a military school. Now, his mother died when he was about 10 years old. She died, died from a type of dysentery. Uh, his uh, dad remarried after about three years, a housewife, a uh, house cleaner that worked for him, and then she died after about five years. So a major portion of the time, Will didn't have a mother. The three older sisters were really important to him. He really respected women. But anyhow, when he was sent to a military school to learn a little discipline, uh, he had went there with the same attitude. They ain't going to teach me nothing. I am not going to follow the rules. And by golly, he didn't. Uh, got in trouble enough times. He uh, had 150 demerits built up. Uh, he got to march an hour for every dis uh, disciplinary reason, for every demerit. So he left behind 150 hours worth of marching. He said, I'm leaving this debt unpaid. I am out of here. Heads for Texas to be a cowboy. Now, he got to be a cowboy on the farm, which was closer to Uligal. Uh, his dad having all those cattle there, Will was a definitely a cowboy, but he wanted to be the kind of cowboy that got to go on cattle drives. He wanted to eat cornbread and beans, and he wanted to camp out and use his saddle for a pillow, and he wanted to rope those steers and just have a good time, and he did. He spent about two years, uh, and while he was on this, his uh, two-year uh, trip, he almost died. Uh, Will, like I say, was so close to uh, history being made that the Hearst Ranch out in San Francisco was buying some horses from a ranch that he was working for. And he worked for a lot of different outfits in those two years' time because uh, one ranch didn't hire cowboys forever. They just needed them for roundups, so he got to change outfits a lot. But he and another cowboy took some horses uh, on a train to California to the Hearst Ranch out there. And while he was there, they did a little sightseeing, went to bed that night, got a hotel room. Will went first class all the way. Uh, before they went to bed, one of them blew the lamp out. Neither one of them ever well, would agree to whoever blew the lamp out, but it was not the kind of lamp you're supposed to blow out. It was a gas lamp. They were used to coal oil or kerosene that you just blew it out and it was all over with. Well, when they blew the lamp out, the gas kept coming. They were almost asphyxiated. And Will was in such bad shape, he was sent back home to recuperate. He gets back to this part of the country, to Indian Territory, and his daddy is no longer living on the farm out of Dudegal. His daddy chose to move into town, into Claremore. He got tired of living by himself. The sisters had moved away. The mothers uh, died. His second wife had died. And he sold the livestock and moved into Claremore. So Will had two hometowns now. He had Dudegal and he had Claremore. Well, he chose to live in Dudegal, even though he always called Claremore his hometown. Uh, he said one time that it's hard enough to make it in this world without having to drag Uligar around with you every place you go. You can't pronounce Uligar unless you're about half Cherokee anyhow. But anyhow, he, his dad put him to the ranch. His dad uh, assigned him about 90 head of cows that he bought for him, and, and Will had to come up with this brand. Now, that's when Will chose the Dog Iron brand. Let me show you what the Dog Iron brand looked like. This was the Dog Iron brand, 
And this came from, it came from the fireplace. It was an andiron or a fire dog in the fireplace that had this design on it. And Will chose that as this brand and he named it the dog iron from fire dog and andiron. It became his ranch, the dog iron ranch. He tried to run the ranch about two years and he had a little difficulty because he wanted to play a little bit too much. He didn't want to stay home and man the ranch. But the good thing that occurred was he met Betty. Uh, Betty was from Rogers, Arkansas. Betty Blake had a sister whose husband ran the train station at Uligal. Will walked into the train station one day expecting to see Will Marshall, and here's his 20-year-old pretty sister-in-law. Will just happened to be 20 years old, so it really fit well. Will was really smitten. Uh, he fell in love with Betty. His whole life changed because he chased her for eight years. Uh, he tried to get her to marry him a time or two, and, and she kind of held off for him, but peer pressure kind of got to Betty. Uh, she'd go home to Rogers, Arkansas, and her friends would ask her about him, and they'd say, uh, Betty, tell us about that cowboy Indian friend of yours that lives in that big wigwam over there in Indian Territory. And it would embarrass Betty, and it took her, took her eight years before she ever gave in to Will. But once they did get married, Will said, I, I did a lot of rope tricks. But the best rope trick I ever did is the night I roped that Betty. The night I married her, that was my star performance. Later on, he said there was two things that made him different from all the other movie stars. He said, one, I'm the ugliest guy in the movies, and two, I still had the same wife I started with all the way. But Will always said he was born and raised in B-I-T, beautiful Indian territory. Actually, never lived in Oklahoma when it had the name of Oklahoma, a statehood. He was, he, by the time we became a state in 1907, uh, he had already moved out of here and working on the stage. Now, he owned land. Uh, Will bought land. Uh, he bought land here in Oklahoma. He bought land in California later on. Uh, as a matter of fact, he said, buy all the land you can because they have made all the land they're ever going to make. So buy what's left. Uh, that's the reason our museum is located on the hilltop in, in Claremore is because he actually bought this land. Will wanted to see the world. He turned 21, he sold his cows, took his money, took a friend of his with him, and as Will uh, had the tendency to do, he was paying the way. And he and a friend of his, they wanted to go to, uh, they wanted to go to Argentina and see the gauchos and the big pampas ranches down there. He had worked with vaqueros and caballeros, but he wanted to see Argentina. He had kind of studied his geography a little bit. Will ended up hitting about five different continents in about a six-month period there because uh, they headed for Argentina thinking they could probably take a train all the way to South America, and they got into the Gulf of Mexico. They found out they'd have to take a ship. Uh, they ended up getting a ship in New York City, and it went via London, England before they got there. Will got seasick every time he hit the ocean. He said he wrote a letter home to Sally, his sister, and he said, Sally, I'm in London, England. I'll probably never see you again because I ain't coming home until they build a bridge all the way back to Claremore. But in the end, Ended up down in South America, so here he goes to his third continent. Spends a little time in Argentina. His buddy came on back home. Will spent his money trying to prove to his dad now that he was grown. He could make it on his own. Did odd jobs. Got a job on a ship. And this ship was going to South Africa. Africa had just fought the Boers' War, which England gained control of it. And the war had ended about 1902, and a lot of their livestock had been killed, and they were a uh, big rancher was buying livestock from Argentina. So Will gets a job on the ship taking care of the livestock, about 4,000 head of horses and donkeys and cows and sheep. Ends up over in Durban, lands in Durban, South Africa. Couldn't get off the ship unless he had a job, so the man that owned the ranch gave him a job. And uh, so he worked just long enough to kind of, like a, a servant or something, uh, indentured servant to get off the ship. And he broke horses and so forth for this man. He broke horses for the English government a little while. And he said one time, he said, you ever try to ride a bucking horse sitting on a pancake? He said, that's what those English saddles are like. He said, I bet you those bu bucking horses kill more soldiers than the Boers ever did over there. Will worked for him a little while, and he finally just traveled around, just did odd jobs, and he's in South Africa in Ladysmith one day taking some donkeys down the road, and he runs into a Wild West show, Texas Jack's Wild West show, and Will joined up with him. Uh, that's where he started doing his rope tricks. $20 a week, he became the Cherokee Kid rope artist. After about a week, he gets a $5 raise. He's making $25 a week now. Sends money home to his dad, put in the bank, uh, pay his insurance. Will always had a lot of insurance and always interested in paying his insurance. 
And uh, his dad would get those checks from Will, and he said, Boy, I hope my, hope my son's coming with this money on us, because I know he ain't been working for a living. But Will did. He joined up with him, stayed there for about a year, and finally he goes to Australia, another continent here. here he hits five continents here in about six months. He works in Australia and New Zealand for the Worth Brothers Circus. Finally gets back to the United States about 1905. He hits San Francisco, spent his money, had to hop a freight train, gets back to Indian Territory, and his dad tries to put him back to the ranch. No, Daddy. Uh, I'm in the Wild West shows now. I, I'm, a, I'm the Cherokee kid. I get $25 a week. So he joined up with the different Wild West shows. He worked for the Mull Hall Wild West show out of Mull Hall, Oklahoma. And he combined a time or two. Mull Hall combined with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show a, a couple of times. And Will got to work with Tom Mix. That's where they met. They ended up being, born, uh, being buried in the same cemetery after both of them were killed out in California in the same cemetery there. But anyhow, Will traveled with the Wild West shows. And then he went to the stage. He started doing his rope tricks in Chicago on the stage. He finally moves to New York City. He's hit the big time on the stage. He does a dumb act. He doesn't talk. And then once he began to talk on the stage, that's when Will really hit the big time. Uh, he'd read the papers. He'd come out on the stage and he'd say, all I really know is what I read in the papers. And that's an alibi for my ignorance. But Will would begin to joke about what was going on on the continent, anywhere in the world. He'd read those papers. He was a, Will really read voraciously a lot of newspapers in New York City and he'd read every one of them. But his monologue was formed from whatever was going on in the papers. He began to tease the politicians. And once he began to tease the politicians, that seemed to hit a, a nerve that everybody enjoyed. Uh, I like to say that Will was a, an advisor to seven of our presidents. They didn't want his advice, but he gave it to them anyhow. He didn't wait around to be asked. He said, I've teased all the big people of the world. And the big people will take teasing. Sometimes the man that thinks he's big, he doesn't like to be teased too well. And Will always said, he said, I'll tease these people. So they don't get mad. So they know I still like them. And he said, I, uh, I'm picking on what they do rather than what they do personally. And, uh, but anyhow, Will began to make enough money that Betty finally agreed that maybe old Will's got some good in him. So 1908, they got married. Uh, and what I think is really interesting, too, is the day after they got married, they got married at her house, Betty's house over at Rogers, Arkansas. They got on a train to go back to New York City where Will was working. He had this time where they could go through St. Louis on that Saturday and watch a football game being played between Washington University there in St. Louis and Carlisle Institute. And who played football for the Carlisle Indians? But Jim Thorpe, Sack and Fox. So Will got to watch Jim Thorpe play a football game. And who was Jim Thorpe's coach? Pop Warner, another famous name. So Will, like I say, Will was so involved with history being made. Uh, they get to New York City, and Betty said, Now, Will, I don't want to live in New York City. I'm from Rogers, Arkansas, and you're from Mooligaw. And Will said, Betty, I promised those people at least one more year of working on that stage, so I better, I better fulfill my obligations. Will very seldom signed the contract. He, he liked to go by word of mouth and... and uh, when he worked for Florence Ziegfeld and the Ziegfeld Follies, it just drove Ziegfeld crazy because Will wouldn't sign a contract. He'd always get his, contra his uh, lawyer to come with him, and when Will made his agreement, Will just bugged him to death, said, you can't trust a man that has to have a lawyer with him all the time. But anyhow, they, uh, Will promised Betty one year, and then they'd come back to either Rogers, Arkansas, or Udegal. Once they got up there, Betty liked it. She said, this is kind of fun, Will. We get to eat out. Will worked about 15 minutes a day on his program, and then they could go to other shows. So they just had a great time, 10 years worth of great time. Uh, four children, all born while he's working on the stage in New York City. Made his first movie in New Jersey in 1918, and then 1919 signed a contract and headed for California. Became a full-time movie star. Uh, when he got out to California, his youngest son died, Freddie, died from diphtheria at 20 months. Uh, we don't have a picture of Freddie in the building. Uh, Will very seldom mentioned his way of dealing with uh, uh, something like that was just to not mention. He very seldom mentioned his mother, which was a very sad time to him. He very seldom mentioned uh, Freddie. Uh, he, about the only time he wrote about either one of them is when he wrote the foreword for Charles Russell's book of short stories, Trails Plowed Under, and he mentioned both of them in there. But anyhow, Will got to California. He made 50 silent movies. He made 21 talking movies. Had a radio program on Sunday nights. 
began to write newspaper articles. For 13 years, he wrote a weekly article. For nine years, he wrote a daily article. Uh, did he change and start using good grammar suddenly? Absolutely not. He still wrote like he did in the fourth grade. Will said one time he quit school, he said, I, my only regret about, about quitting school when I was 18 is I just never did take a chance on that fifth grade. He said, I think I'd have been a good fifth grader because I was a good fourth grader there for about six years in a row. The newspaper were told, don't change what Will writes. A lot of them wanted to edit it. His paper went to New, or his article went to New York City, uh, to the McNaught Syndicate, and it went to 400 different newspapers. And one of the editors was fussing at him one time, and they said, Will, you just slay the Queen's English, and you use ain't so much, and ain't, ain't's not good to have in the paper all the time. This was during the Depression years. And Will said, I know a lot of people that don't use ain't, that ain't eating right now, so I think I'll just go ahead and keep using it. They said, don't you proofread what you write? You have so many mistakes. And he said, no, they don't pay me to read. They pay me to write a writer's fee. He said, let somebody else do the reading. He said, I'm not going to ruin my stories with uh, trying to worry about good spelling and good sentence structure. But anyhow, Will became a multimillionaire. He became what a philanthropist. People like Will because they trusted Will. When he got on the uh, uh, talking movies, it was, there was some concern about whether Will would make it or not because he didn't have just the world's best sounding voice. But they liked, people liked him because he was natural. Will said one time, he said, I'm not an actor. Uh, I just find the parts that fit me, and that way I don't have to act. But people believed in him. Uh, he was invited to the White House two different times. He uh, spent nights in the White House when uh, uh, Calvin Coolidge was president and then when Franklin Roosevelt was president. Will never did really get involved in politics other than to tease people about politics, but he actually did help Franklin Roosevelt get elected. Uh, he campaigned for him. He introduced him at the uh, Rose Bowl, a big... Uh, doings they had there, but by the same token, if Franklin Roosevelt did something Will didn't like, he'd hammer him just like he would anybody else. Uh, he didn't think we ought to be in the World Bank when Franklin Roosevelt was trying to get in that, and Will just, boy, he just rode against it, and one of the uh, uh, Franklin's secretaries contacted Will and said, could you, uh, could you let up on Franklin a little bit about that? And Will said, absolutely not. He said, I'm not going to change. If I think something needs to be done that way, I'm going to do it. And that was Will. Uh, Will, people knew that Will was Will. Uh, he was introduced by H.L. Mencken one time at a, a convention. They were both covering the convention. And uh, Mencken introduced Will as the most dangerous writer in the world. He said he can make a man or he can break a man by what he writes. And Will said, now Mencken, you know better than that. Said a guy would have to be an idiot to believe what I write. And Mencken said that's 85% of the Americans right there because they believe everything that you write. But Will was world known. He, was, he, he could go anywhere in the world almost and be known. And he acted the same way. Uh, one of my favorite stories has to do with Calvin Coolidge. Of course, when he went to the White House to spend the night with Calvin Coolidge, Calvin's secretary said, see if you can get old Stoneface there, uh, Silent Cal, see if you can get him to lighten up a little bit. When Will met him, he stuck his hand out and said, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I, I didn't catch your first name. And said, Coolidge laughed. Said he was just as calm as anybody else was. Will was always proud of the fact that he had the Indian heritage. Uh, he wrote a little uh, scene in a movie called So This Is London, and he also used it in some of his writings. If he found a, a saying that he liked, he'd use that saying in different, different ways uh, from then on. But anyhow, he wrote the little article where he was applying for the uh, passport, and he had to have a, a uh, birth certificate. And, of course, he told the man that he didn't have a birth certificate because they didn't have him in Indian territory back then, and the man kept quizzing him there at the... Bureau of Statistics there, and finally asked him, are you an American? He said, I guess I'm American. Said, my mom and dad were both born here in Indian Territory and raised there, and I was born and raised. He said, I'm not exactly the kind of American whose family came over, whose ancestors came over on the Mayflower, but my family was there to meet the boat when it landed. He said, it's always been a discredit to the Indian race that we ever let them land in the first place. And we'll like to point that out. He, uh, uh, he, he liked to uh, let his feelings be known about Andrew Jackson. You know, there'll never be a Cherokee named Andrew or Jackson because of the Trail of Tears. Uh, Will was believable. What he would write, people would believe him because he wrote what he thought. He wrote from the heart. Died in a plane crash, 1935. Uh, when Will was growing up, of course, there were no planes. There were no automobiles. Uh, flew in his first airplane in 1916 
and it excited him. He said, I was afraid to ride a tall horse, and here I am going over the tops of buildings. And so he really was a, uh, a pusher for aviation. He was kind of the patron saint of aviation. World War I, we didn't have an Air Force. Uh, we got some planes there. Uh, in World War II, at the beginning, we didn't have an Air Force, and Will was always the one that pushed for it. We had the Army Air Corps and the Navy Air Corps, and he always pushed for the, for the uh, Air Force, and finally when we got the Air Force, he thought it was a good deal. He said, people don't respect airplanes, and they probably won't until they get something dropped on the head. Uh, after World War I, he mentioned that uh, the next war will probably be fought dropping things out of airplanes, and how true he was. Uh, anybody that was important in aviation, Will would go meet him. Charles Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart, Billy Mitchell, all these people that were important in aviation, Will would meet, meet him, flew with uh, Lindbergh several times, but that's what he wrote his daily articles about. He'd, he'd write about the aviation, loved to travel, and he got to travel. He got paid for it by being the newsman. But when he finally met Wiley Post, Wiley Post had, uh, uh, was a one-eyed pilot, lost his eye working in an oil field, and uh, got to be a pretty darn good pilot. Started jumping out of airplanes at air shows, and then the pilots began to show him what to do, and he began to fly. And finally, he flew an airplane that belonged to two oil men. Uh, the Winnie Mae was the name of this plane, and he set some records in it. While he set two speed records around the world, uh, he set an altitude record. Uh, in 1934, he set uh, he went 50,000 feet high up here at Bartlesville, and. Uh, uh, had to have a space suit to do it, so he invented the first space suit and used liquid oxygen, and, and uh, uh, that suit is in the uh, History Center in Oklahoma City today in the Wally Post room. But anyhow, he bought that airplane from the oil man. It's in our Smithsonian Institute today. But he wanted to build another plane. Wally did. He wanted to fly from Alaska Territory to Russia across the Bering Sea. He came to Will, who he had met a couple of times. As a matter of fact, he had come to Claremore, in 1931, when they opened the Will Rogers uh, Airport, which is no longer here. We have an airport, but not that one anymore. But anyhow, when they opened it up, they had him and the navigator uh, come here. And Will met him in Tulsa, as a matter of fact, and flew up here uh, from Tulsa in the Winnie Mae with them. But Will loved flying enough that Wiley Post thought that he could uh, use a little of his money to build an airplane to fly from Alaska to uh, Siberia, and of course, we all went along with it. He said, you betcha, I might want to go with you, though. So Wiley built a plane. Uh, he put it together, bought a fuselage, bought the wings, and put a, certain pontoons on it. Uh, Lockheed gave him an engine that was 550 horsepower, which they actually got back after the plane crashed because they still owned it. But Will paid for it, and that's how they got together. Will decided he wanted to go along. So 1935, they met in Seattle, Washington, and they flew for nine days up in Alaska, and all the time Will's writing his daily newspaper articles, his weekly newspaper articles on that old typewriter, the old hunt and peck system there, and they were killed on the 15th. On the 15th, they were going to go from Fairbanks, Alaska to Point Barrow, Barrow, Alaska, spend the night, and then come back to Fairbanks the next day and refuel all six of the gas tanks and then make the hop across the Bering Sea the next day. But they didn't get to Barrow that day on the 15th. Uh, it was so cloudy, so foggy, they had to rise up above the mountains and stay above them. They stayed above them for probably 26 hours. Uh, had plenty of gas, so they didn't have any trouble staying up. But they finally found a break in the clouds. They found some Eskimos that were camped out. Uh, they went down with pontoons. They landed on a slough and asked directions. And uh, one Eskimo fellow came out and talked to them and told them where they needed to go. They were 15 miles away from Barrow. They got back in the plane, they taxied up the river, banked it back to the right, about 65 feet high, not even as high as a basketball court. The plane was probably going 100 miles an hour, and the engine died. Something caused the carburetor to stop. The plane hit that water and, and just destroyed it, and they were killed instantly. Wiley's buried in Edmond, Oklahoma. Will was buried originally out in Glendale, California, because that's where the movie stars lived, and that's where he was living out there making movies. Uh, Today, he resides in an underground mausoleum on the hilltop that he bought in 1911. 1911, Will bought this property up here on this hilltop in May. In October the 20th, his first son was born, and then October the 29th, his dad died. So that was a very memorable year, but that held on to this land all that time. So Betty gave this land, the widow gave this land to the state of Oklahoma. Uh, if they would build this a memorial, she kind of set up what she wanted uh, the legislature appropriated money, plus school kids brought pennies to school. Uh, some people will come in here and tell me they remembered 
pennies being taken up in their in their school. One man told me he didn't have a penny, so he couldn't bring a penny back in 1937. And uh, anyhow, they built this memorial in nine months. They started it in April. They opened it on Will's birthday, November the 4th, in uh, 1938. 1944, they designed the tomb out here. Uh, Betty had cancer. She was dying from cancer, and she designed the tomb. They brought the infant son along with Will back from California. And then as the children died, uh, two of them were placed here. Uh, Betty was placed here in 44. Mary died in 1989 at age 76. And then Jimmy died in 2000. He was about 85 when he died, along with his wife, Astria, buried out there. So there's six of them buried out here in the underground mausoleum. Will Jr., he was born there in 1911, uh, was the only one that's not buried here. And he died in Tubac, Arizona, and left instructions to uh, be buried out there. Today we operate this memorial. We also have the birthplace ranch where Will was born. Will acquired uh, the deed to it after his dad died in 1911. It went to uh, two sisters and the heirs of one of his sisters and Will. And then by that time, Will had money that he bought it back from them. So he acquired this hilltop and that uh, property out there all about 1911. So we operate the birthplace ranch. Uh, the house has been moved because of Oolagal Lake was was uh, flooded there, inundated, so the house had to be moved uh, on the same ranch. So today we operate both of them through the state of Oklahoma, and we welcome a lot of school people in here because Will was so involved with making history. If you study Will, you study Oklahoma history.